So do I start? Okay, so it's not being recorded. Okay, so good evening everyone and welcome to the scientific research conference organized by SP Al Azhar. Uh, here is Maryam Shreif, a senior petroleum engineering student at the Lebanese American University, and I'll be representing uh, SP Al Azhar in this conference. SP Al Azhar student chapter has been established in 2005 by students at the petroleum engineering department. This chapter has organized several technical and non-technical sessions and conferences and participated in outstanding conferences uh, such as CDC, SPORC, and PACE. Moreover, this chapter has won several awards, including the Outstanding Student Chapter Award in 2021 and the Excellence Award in 2020. For those who are interested in conducting research, scientific research, and lack the knowledge on how mm -hmm. to begin, your participation in this conference is a great opportunity as you'll be introduced to scientific research, the action needed to produce and develop scientific knowledge, its importance and the common research topics in the petroleum industry. So mainly this conference will be divided into six uh, sessions, which will be held between November 16 and November, uh, till November 21. And please note there will be a student contest at the end of this conference. All you have to do is to send your, uh, the presentation of your research to SP Al Azhar's Gmail and the assigned committee will be selecting a winner to publish his or her presentation in the Petrocraft magazine and present it at the Egyptian Petroleum Show. And surely you'll be receiving at the, at, uh, the end of this conference a certificate of attendance. Now, without any further ado, Today, we'll begin the conference with a session presented by a distinguished expert in the petroleum industry, Dr. Medhat Kamal, where he'll be discussing the importance of scientific research and student paper contest and the role of SP International in assisting, in assisting students in scientific research, along with highlighting the major research areas and topics in the oil and gas industry. So let me begin by introducing Dr. Kamal, Dr. Kamal is a Chevron Fellow Emeritus with the primary responsibilities, including competency development within the company, identification and development of emerging and white space technology opportunities, and provision of technological advice and counsel to senior manage management. He formerly was a Fellow and a leader at the Dynamic Reservoir Characterization Group for Chevron Energy Technology Company. And before Chevron, Dr. Methat has worked for Arco, Flow Patrol, Slumberjay, and Amoco. Dr. Kamal has been recognized as an SPE distinguished member and an, and an honorary member and has received SPE's Cedric uh, Ferguson Medal, North and East Texas Regional Service Award, Formation Evaluation Award, and the Distinguished Service Award. He has twice served as a distinguished lecturer. And finally, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kamal holds a master's and a doctorate degrees in petroleum engineering from Stanford University and a bachelor and a master's degrees in petroleum engineering from Cairo University. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kamal. So welcome doctor and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we are pleasured to have you as our guest speaker in this conference. And on a final note, if you have any question related to the presentation, please feel free to drop it down in the Q&A section and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Now, please uh, keep note that we'll be having another mm -hmm. session today at 8.30 with Dr. Tarek Abul Futuh, the faculty advisor of SPE Lazar. Uh, now, without any further ado, Dr. Kamal, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice introduction and uh, thank you to the organizing committee from the Al-Azhar University SPE student chapter for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you guys and uh, maybe I just want to start by uh, talking a little bit about something that maybe most of you don't know and it doesn't show up in my uh, biographical sketch. 
I actually worked for Al Azhar University for a very short time. When uh, Al Azhar University first started the Department of Petroleum Engineering back in around 1968, at that time I was working as Mu'id at Cairo University. And uh, Al Azhar mm -hmm. University, when they first started, they didn't have any, actually, they didn't have any Mu'ideen. They only had one faculty member. So we were uh, uh, asked to actually do the teaching, uh, the Mu'id part of the teaching at Al Azhar University. And I actually uh, worked there for, I would say, two years uh, before I actually uh, left uh, Egypt and went to the United States. So uh, I am, uh, which is one of the first groups that I worked for was Al Azhar University. So I'm glad. I got a chance to uh, talk to the student uh, of that university again today. Uh, one other thing that I would like to share with you before I talk about specifically the topics you asked me to address is that I just want to mention to you that they're actually uh, looking for you. You guys are looking forward to be hosting several uh, important uh, conferences and meetings in Egypt. Uh, in the next year or two, uh, the Mediterranean Offshore Conference is going to be in Alexandria in towards the end of 2022. And the North Africa and East Mediterranean um, Regional Meeting is going to be there in 2023. And as I'm sure most of you know by now, that the United Nations decided that uh, the next uh, community of uh, practices of, of, of practices uh, climate uh, change meeting is going to be in Sharm el Sheikh next year. So you guys are looking forward to hosting a lot of meetings next year, uh, and I'm I'm sure that you are going to be uh, very successful and providing a lot of people with uh, great opportunities to share information and to learn. Uh, now for uh, my discussion today, <clears throat> uh, I specifically were asked to talk about, uh, number one, the value of research for uh, uh, the industry for petroleum engineering. And I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about that. We'll also ask it about uh, how the Society of Petroleum Engineers uh, support students uh, in actually lear their learning uh, journey and also in their um, doing any research work. I'll, I'll spend some time talking about that as well. And uh, I'm gonna uh, also mention some of the new ar areas where uh, uh, people need to focus on our research. Actually, there is a wi wi wide range, but I'm just gonna mention a few of them and then we will uh, we will summarize and uh, uh, we will have, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for any questions you may have. So uh, <clears throat> research actually has helped our industry uh, over the years. Our industry in the modern area is, uh, is more than a hundred years. Uh, this is when we talk about the modern area. Actually the use of Petroleum or petroleum products is something that dates back in the history of mankind for a very, very, very long time. Uh, the first use of petroleum product recorded in the history was done by uh, ancient Egyptians, where they used tar in the mummification of uh, their deceased ones. This is the first, uh, the earliest recorded use of petroleum product in the history, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the uh, modern or uh, recent history, which is started about 100 years ago. So uh, as a result of, of the research, there have been a lot of developments and improvements in what doing, doing on work. Uh, just examples in the area of drilling, the first well that was ever drilled uh, was drilled to a total depth of 69 and a half feet. That's it. That was the, the, the Drake well that was uh, uh, drilled towards the end of the 19th century. Now, because of the 
research that was done in the drilling area uh, over the years, in different parts of it, uh, uh, maintaining of pressure, the different casing that we're using, uh, just that even the tubular that we use in drilling. Right now, we can actually drill wells in water depths of more than 11,000 feet and to a total, total depth of exceeding 30,000 feet. Uh, as as, as uh, you can see in that picture. Another area in the area of uh, fracturing, which is an area of production engineering, uh, the first fracture was done, was done back in 1949, and uh, in a gas field called the Hugoton field, it's one of the largest field, gas fields in the United States, an old field, uh, and they, all what they used was 3,000 gallons of fluid. That all what was used. Because of a lot of the research that was done in rock mechanics and in uh, uh, fluid transport, uh, we were able in around the early 1980s to have fractures that uh, uh, exceeded uh, almost a mile long. And uh, we used to something like about a quarter of a million gallons of fluids and half a million pounds of propens in, in this uh, uh, fracturing, fracturing operations. As you can see by the picture of the large number of pumping trucks that are gathered around the world just in order to do one job. And then later on, when uh, petroleum engineers decide found a way to produce gas and oil from a very tight truck. In order to do that, we actually had to, as you, I'm not sure most of you know, we, were able, we needed to drill horizontal wells and were able to have several segments of fractures uh, in them, like you can see in the picture on the right, and, and, and we can do that. Without the research that is done, in, in the areas of uh, drilling, rock mechanics, fracturing, fluid transport, we we're not going to be able to do that. And as a result of uh, these uh, developments, we are able to produce enough oil and gas to satisfy the energy needs that the whole world requires. Another area of changes in, in, in uh, research is the area of reservoir. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, the way we people used to predict, predict the performance of wells is by using decline curve analysis. Decline curve analysis actually doesn't have any physics in it. Uh, you just simply look at uh, the you, you simply look at uh, the historic uh, behavior of the production from a well, and then you extrapolate that based on uh, finding an, an, an equation that you can actually fit the data on at the beginning and extrapolate later on. Uh, after that, we actually started figuring out that no, we can use material balance in our uh, calculations to, to do that. By the way, the only reason I'm showing an equation here, which I don't think that it's a good idea to show equations in presentation, as it distracts everybody and nobody can know anything about get, do anything about it, that I couldn't find a nice picture to show material balance. And also we added to the material balance what happens when we actually have water influxing into the, the, the formation. Following that, then uh, as we as we tried very hard to find ways, analytical ways to predict the performance of reservoirs with time, and we found that that we were a little bit unable to do that, then we decided, okay, we're gonna go into the numerical way. We are actually going to solve the problem numerically rather than analytically. And then we did, uh, we started doing a numerical simulation, reservoir modeling. And you can see from this picture, uh, we started at, at the beginning by having uh, um, equi uh, uh, models in one, di in one dimension, then two dimensions, then three dimensions. And then one of the latest things that we, we're, we're doing is that we are doing data science and engineering analytics 
in order to help us with, with that work. And I'm going to talk about that one a little bit uh, a little bit later as well. So there always has been uh, use of continuous development and continuous research that's being done uh, in different parts of our uh, petroleum engineering. And as a result of that research, our ability to produce uh, oil and gas continue to increase and we're able to produce from more and more uh, complex reservoirs, reservoirs in areas which are difficult to reach. And we were able to provide the world with the energy everybody needs uh, in order to have uh, the way of life we're all accustomed to today. This is our main contribution to, to the world. And that's the main calling of petroleum engineering. Uh, <clears throat> this is an example of uh, what we're doing with machine learning. Uh, on the top left of your picture, you see a whole bunch of uh, uh, graphs. Each one of these graphs is actually a test that was run in one field in order to characterize that field and predict its performance. This is taken from a field called the Tahiti field. It's a, an offshore field in the Gulf of Mexico in the United States. It's a deep water field. Now, in order to actually have one of us engineers sit down and try to analyze each one of these tests, each one of these tests, we have a very large number of them. And uh, the, by the way, that's another, another result of developments of research work. The reason we have that many tests, that many data points, is that because now we have uh, downhole pressure gauges that we can actually, uh, uh, when we're completing the well, have the gauge sitting in the well all the time, collecting data all the time. Every time there is a, there is a requirement to shut the well in for whatever operational reason, we actually have data that can help us uh, to characterize the reservoir. So for us engineers, each one of us will actually have to sit down and analyze each one of these tests. And assuming that uh, um, we have the proper software and we actually <clears throat> are very knowledgeable about that work, then uh, you, can, you can see that in order to analyze uh, uh, 46 tests, from one well, well A, then that will require 92 hours from an engineering time. This is only assuming that you're going to only use two hours to analyze it. It's usually it actually takes more. But in, in the idea from this slide is just show the impact of the developments that we've done. However, <clears throat> if we actually use machine learning, you can see that you can actually analyze 80 tests uh, for in five minutes. And the same thing with done with will be. So what does this thing do? Is that number one, it actually allows us to analyze a lot of the data that we're getting without this development. We're not going to be able to do that because nobody has the time to analyze all these tests. And now by doing this analysis, it will actually it will giving us more information that will actually allow us to better manage our reservoir that actually frees us engineers from having to do the work of actually analyzing a test after a test after a test. Let the machine do that work and make the engineer spend his or her time actually thinking about uh, planning and the strategizing and figuring out exactly what are we going to do in order to maximize or optimize the production from our field. So as, as you can see, uh, Scientific research has actually helped us a whole lot over a very wide range of areas over the years. Now, <clears throat> uh, one of the added things of uh, scientific research also is that we are now able to uh, produce oil and gas from very tight formation. We were not able to do that uh, before. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story here. Uh, long time ago, when I was a student uh, studying petroleum engineering at Cairo University, like you guys, most of you now, uh, at Al-Azhar University, 
and um, went to uh, spend a summer internship with Shell. Um, and what happened is that uh, Shell was hosting a lot of students from different areas everywhere, uh, not only engineers, engineers and accountants and, and everywhere and at the, at, the, at the summer. And at the beginning of that uh, summer, they actually had a big meeting for all the students that they are going to uh, help them with internship. And they were presenting to all of us something about what the oil industry is. Now, those of us who were studying petroleum engineering or geology knew a lot about it, but a lot of the majority of the students who were attending in that meeting uh, didn't know anything about petroleum engineering. Or, or the oil industry. So uh, we have at the beginning some geologists telling people that uh, in order to uh, produce fine oil and gas reservoir, we actually have to look for reservoir. And he said that the reservoir need to be something look like a dome uh, where you can actually have uh, the oil and gas trapped in it, something that you all know, but uh, people who are not petroleum engineers don't know that or geologists. And I remember that there was one student, uh, she was studying accounting, of course, and she said, well, what's the problem? Uh, why don't you just simply go ahead and uh, make a reservoir under the ground and wait for the oil to come into it? Now, of course, all of us uh, who, are, who, know, who know about petroleum engineering laughed at that, saying that, you know, this person is actually thinking that we can actually go ahead and make a reservoir. Uh, of course, you know, it's, that's not possible. Now, but when you actually come to think about it, when we're talking about producing from shale or tight, very ultra tight reservoirs, these are rock that fluid doesn't flow from. But what we're doing is that we're, we're the ability to drill horizontal wells and have as many fractures that we're doing, we are actually creating a reservoir rock. So, Whatever that young lady uh, made a, a point about, why don't you go ahead and make a reservoir? And we laughed that. We actually are making reservoirs now as a result of all the research that we did. One point I want to make about that specific thing about uh, producing from uh, tight uh, reservoirs, and especially from producing gas, a lot of gas from tight reservoirs, is that because of the production of gas, um, and you additional use of, of, of gas and of natural gases. You can see this curve when you talk about the, the, the increase in the gas production. Uh, as a result of that, <clears throat> because as you all know, natural gas uh, is, is cleaner than uh, coal or cream than oil. You can see that the CO2 emissions have decreased. So we actually, this is a, that was not an intended consequence, but it's a, it's a positive consequence that came from the result of that work. I think the next thing that I want to talk about is that I was asked about, uh, talk about how SPE uh, helps students uh, do research. Well, SPE actually does not make, do, do research. Or do, we do not, SPE's job is not to uh, allow people to do research. SPE's job is to uh, help disseminate all the information that comes from research from any group so everybody else can use it. And also SPE's job is to help or petroleum engineers, including of course students, into uh, expanding their abilities uh, and increasing their skills uh, to be successful engineers through uh, increasing their technical information, the information they have about increasing their ability to uh, uh, show their results, ability to uh, present their work. So these are the things that, that is the, the job of the Petroleum uh, Engineering Society. So some of the things that, that are done in order to uh, help our student members uh, expand their uh, skill sets are things that you can see in the slide. Petro Bowl, student paper context, ambassador lecture program, and so on. I'm going to only talk a little bit about some of them. First of all, let's talk about the, the Petro Bowl. 
Uh, Petro Wall is uh, simply a, a situation where we have a competition uh, among students from different universities. Uh, and so you have teams and, uh, and these teams uh, gather and they have the competition where they actually get asked both technical and non-technical questions about uh, the industry. And they, they actually compete in, in, in answering this question. <clears throat> and then uh, each region have its own uh, first round, uh, preliminary, if you may say, it, uh, competitions. Uh, uh, and then the people who qualify from each one of these groups, they actually meet at the annual technical uh, exhibition and com uh, annual technical conference and exhibit ATCE, the main conference, uh, where they actually have final competition and figure out uh, which one of them actually answer the question more. It's a very uh, interesting work. It's a very uh, fun, actually, activity to have. And it's, uh, as a result of these activities also, you find students from different universities uh, meeting with each other, uh, talking with each other, forming friendship, increasing their networks. And it's actually very positive uh, results. And of course, so they also learn about uh, the, the, the technical information and the non-technical information that being asked and they prefer for it. Uh, the slide on the part of the slide on the right shows uh, the name of the universities that actually participated in the final round in that last SPE meeting uh, that was done in Dubai a few months, a couple of months ago. Uh, of course, these things were done uh, as most of you know, uh, right now we're, we're do, do a lot of things virtually because of the of the pandemic. And uh, I would be amiss if I don't uh, thank uh, Chevron Company because they are the company. Uh, they are, this is a company that sponsors all these activities. Another uh, uh, something that uh, is is uh, is very helpful for the students is the student paper contest. The student paper contest, of course, the main advantage of it is that students actually get to, uh, first of all, right, uh, they are doing their, their work or uh, researching a given point, uh, whether they are on the undergraduate level or the graduate level, they are, they are, they are doing a specific uh, a little research uh, for, for a topic, maybe for mashrua, um, uh, for the final year, or they are, they are, they are doing their research work. And uh, now the point is that we need to present their work to everybody. So they write an abstract to start with, and then uh, they make a presentation. Um, and then uh, there, there's a comp another a friendly competition among them to figure out uh, which one of them did the best work and actually more importantly also presented that work. So uh, the, the, the skills of making a successful presentation is, is one of the, of the things that we learn through the student paper, through student paper contest. Uh, there are different 14 regional world parts of the world that you can see on that uh, map, including the Middle East region, which this is the region where Al-Azhar University uh, is part of. And uh, of course, in these uh, meetings, uh, students from different universities uh, make, present their, their work. And then uh, the winner of, uh, of the, the regional contest, they actually meet at the annual meeting and the, the international champ uh, champions are, are presenting. Uh, now, in order to uh, participate in the student paper contest, uh, usually every university will have their way of uh, figuring out how to um, we select the students who are going to present because sometimes you have more than uh, a lot, large number of students want to compete and maybe not all of them are allowed to do that. Uh, so there are rules that need to be uh, followed. So uh, each one of the students need to actually uh, find out about what rules are there for within their university first and then within the region second uh, in order to prepare for their uh, presentation 
And uh, uh, usually, after this presentation, usually there is a, a panel of judges that they actually will listen to the presentations. They are actually going to uh, ask questions. Uh, and the main reason for asking the question is to actually help the students uh, figure out how to answer the question and think a little bit about it. So it's, it's all part of the development of our future engineers, more really than actually having a competition. One of the things that uh, we actually, all of us live in a world which has um, laws in it. Sometimes these laws are not very uh, uh, conducive to dissemination of technology. Sometimes there are sanctions. Uh, companies, con different countries have sanctions against them. They're not allowed to compete. We have nothing to do with that. Uh, but as a society, of, uh, we have to follow the laws whatever countries we work in. So uh, we need to be aware of that. And then uh, one of the things that are uh, also uh, important to recognize about the student paper contest is that the papers that are presented, they only usually have one author in it. It's not like the normal paper that we present in, in conferences where it can have multiple authors. Uh, you have to put an abstract, uh, about uh, the, a, a limit of number of words, uh, you have to follow, of course. And one of the other things is that, of course, what's been presented should be an original work. Uh, it is not uh, something that is done like, a, uh, for example, uh, I some, on one time I wrote a paper uh, uh, summarizing all the work that was done in one area of technology. A paper like that uh, would not be eligible to be part of the student paper contest. It's a very good exercise. And uh, uh, I, I invite all of you to, to look to look at that. And actually, uh, if, I'm sure that within, within your university, uh, your professors are going to uh, have a, a help you and, and, and um, you'll be able to participate in the competition for the uh, Middle East region and, and, and move on for, for the week after that. Another, uh, another way of uh, supporting the students is the ambassador lecture program. And that's uh, usually a program. Uh, this is run by actually by the young member of the set. Uh, the, uh, uh, the young, 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 young professionals of the society are the one who run that. It's actually having lectures uh, that are actually presented by young members. And uh, the main point for these lectures is that they are important to inform the students about what are they going to be expecting next when they actually leave the university and start working in the industry. Uh, they actually talk about career guidance. They talk about what are you expecting when you first start working. Now, you're not a student anymore. You are going to be working on a, on a company. Your expectation for you to produce. Uh, how are you going to be? Uh, judge how are you going to be able to uh, 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 your progress within your company. So it is the career guidance information that given to them. They also provide in this lecture, they provide the student members with an updated information about what's happening in the industry. And they give them uh, uh, real life uh, experiences. This is what I found when I first got out of the university and started working. I found out that uh, uh, what is more, what's more important, uh, what's more important is that I need to be, for example, I need to be thinking about um, what, uh, how, am I, how is my work is going to uh, fulfill the objectives of my company? How, uh, why is my company is actually trying to do? What is the bottom line of my company? Uh, and what, what then, then how is my work is going to do that? That's what I need to be focusing on rather than anything. Just, just one, one example. And they give, the, they give the students some actual stories to, to, to make them recognize what are they going to be uh, looking at. So that, that ambassador lecture program is a, is a, very, is a very helpful program. And uh, uh, I would look, if you go to the SPE website, you will find information about that program. You'll find information about some of these available lectures, and you may be actually able to invite some of the speakers to come and talk to your uh, uh, section, just like uh, 
you did a, you actually asked me to come and talk to you. Uh, another uh, thing that uh, uh, we think is, is helpful is, uh, is an, a publication that is uh, geared towards young members. Of course, that includes students, young members. It, it's, 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 it's a publication that's called The Way Ahead. And uh, I'm just going to give you, talk about one example of what is uh, what some of the stuff that's, that's uh, included in The Way Ahead. Uh, they have information about career maintenance. They, 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 they talk about how do you write your resume or your CV in order to be able to have a successful uh, way of uh, looking for positions um, and, and landing this position. They, they actually teach you, young people, about uh, once you start working and you are going to be judged by measuring your performance every year, how are you going, what's the best way to handle that? Uh, how to have a career development plan. You think about what do I need to do? What, 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 I, what do I like to do 10 years from now? And how do I do that? Uh, how, what should I do in order to get to that point? So uh, there are, in, in, the, in the way ahead, there are articles about how to do that. Another important thing is about how to do networking, which is a very important part of expanding your uh, group of people that you know, which will actually help you throughout your, your career. Uh, it also talks about uh, uh, if there is any uh, opportunities that in front of you, how do you look for them? Of course, that is that specific part is uh, country specific. Each country has different rules, have different uh, ways uh, of uh, available position, available jobs. Uh, and there is no one size fits all in that thing. What works in Egypt is not exactly what works in Brazil or not work in France or something like that. It also talk, 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 with, talk with you about what do you do when, uh, and how you prepare for, for a new job that you, uh, you, 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 you're going to be going for. So uh, the main point actually in the, in the work that we say that in order to achieve your goals, you need to be working on developing the skills that it will actually allow you to do the skills. So, so the, there's a whole lot of information in there for our young members in, in general and our student member in particular in order to, to help them with, with the thing. So these are several of the things that are available from the Society of Petroleum Engineer geared specifically towards our student members and our young members. Uh, one of the other points that I, I, I would like to talk about is to talk about the challenges that are facing our industry today. Uh, and there are, um, I would say, main challenges. Number one is that we need to have a sustainable production. There is a question about the climate change, and there is something about the transition of the energy from uh, uh, non-renewable energy to renewable energy. One thing that people a lot talk about these days is they also talk about the effect of uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19. And I intentionally not talking about that because uh, after all, this is a short term thing. Of course, it's been a couple of years, but still two or three years is a short term thing. And we're going to get out of it and we're starting to get out of it. So that's not something that we need to be thinking about in the long term. For right now, of course, we're doing what we can in order to mitigate that and keep ourselves healthy. Uh, but what we really need to talk about is that we need to talk about uh, the things that are going to be in the, in the long run. So when we talk about the first, we talk about the sustainable production. Uh, the main point is we need to continue to produce oil and gas for decades to come. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. The point is, uh, if you look at this graph here, <clears throat> that's a graph that's done by the International Energy Agency. This is an agency of the European Union. There is a similar agency to that on the American side that's called the EIA for the Energy Information Administration. Okay, it's the same, it's the same three letters, but you arrange them differently. Uh, 
as, as I remember one time I used <clears throat> I used to watch an American comic comedy play that they used to say same thing here okay so um, you can see from that one here it say that uh, for what we need from uh, uh, the million of tetrajoules that need production and you can see here that the number keeps on increasing uh, the dark blue things for, for the developing economies and the light blue things for the advanced economies um, uh, there is a lot of reasons for that mainly that the, that that uh, the number of us are increasing, people, number of people in the world are increasing, and the, the economic avail uh, uh, capabilities of people and the importance of the way of life of people is improving. Uh, there are about one billion people, one billion, who's been, one billion. Uh, I think, I think in, in Egypt, what we call billion in the United States, in Egypt, they call Milliard, one billion people in, in the world who do not have electricity right now. So this is just one example. So there is a, there is a, an, an, a, a very increase in energy that is required from the people. Now, now let's look at what this energy is going to come from. Uh, you can see from 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 this graph, uh, the blue bars are for now. And the gray bars are for 2040, and there are similar sums for them for uh, 2050s. And you can see that uh, both the oil, there may be a slight, there's some reduction in the, in the oil in, in, in part of it. You can see there is a range because, of course, these numbers are not exact. There is, there are forecasts. The, uh, you can see that the range for the oil is that, okay, maybe it's about the same or right now, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more. Uh, definitely the gas is increasing. You can see the renewables after that. Of course, there is a large increase in them, but they are starting from a very low point. So the large increase is just relative. Coal, in, in spite of all the things you hear about, is still, still going to be uh, a part of, of, of the equation. So, and, and biochemistry and nuclear at the end. So the main point is that we, we need to continue to produce oil and gas using the technology that we have today and actually even improving and adding to that technology because the amount that we need to produce are going to continue to increase uh, with time. Here is, here is a, a, a graph. Now, this graph is now done by the EIA. That is a part of the, the organization from the United States. Their job is to predict and, and, uh, and uh, advise the government of the United States about what is the needed for energy for, for the country for years to come and how to uh, help that. And you can see there that uh, if you look at the title of the thing, it says that, uh, that renewables uh, uh, have the most use, which is, that, that's what the title say. But now let's look at this graph itself. Here is the renewable. This is, has about 250 uh, 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 British thermal units. Now look at look at look at the oil. The oil is about two forty five. Look at the gas; it's about two hundred. So actually, when you look at the oil and gas, they are much much bigger than what the renewables are. So the main point I'm saying is that what we are doing today, what we're producing today, we will continue to need that for twenty fifty. At least, and then and, and, and you can see the, the curves, you can extrapolate if you wanted to. Uh, so we actually need to continue to do research in doing in producing what we have today because we need to improve the production. Right now, if you look at uh, the fields that we have and you say this one will produce with them, we don't have enough production to cover what's needed from us in 2050. We need to improve on that. In addition to that, now of course, uh, this is a this is a similar one. In the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about. It. It's a very similar uh, curve. Uh, now, th there is there is a, the uh, the challenge of the climate change, and we in the oil industry uh, are are doing our part. Uh, first of all, there is a there is an initiative called the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. That's an initiative that is done by 
the, all the large organizations in the world that are producing, they are shown here their picture in alphabetical order. And they're just simply saying that uh, we know that there is a climate change issues and we are doing, we are going to continue to do what we can in order to uh, support having a safe planet for everyone. But let's now talk about specifics. In order to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the world, there are different things. We all hear about carbon capture and, and, and sequestration. How are you going to sequester? How are you going to remove that carbon dioxide? The main way of doing it, and the only practical way of doing it, is to inject it under the ground. In this graph picture here, there are different ways, different schemes either to inject it to as an enhanced oil recovery, or you inject it in uh, uh, fields that have already been depleted from the oil and gas from them, or you and inject it simply in cell information. Uh, who's going to do that? You will, when you graduate, you will gonna be the one doing that. Uh, the work you're gonna be doing is an important part of solving the climate change issue. Uh, here is an example of what we're doing today in order to capture uh, the carbon. Uh, this, is, this is just one project. This project is, you can see that how many million tons every year that are injected in this project. Gorgon is a project in Northwest Australia. Uh, it's, a, it's a gas field and, and uh, uh, oh, there is a lot of, they, they take the carbon dioxide and inject it under the ground. So this is just, uh, just one example. Uh, another another uh, area that we're helping with is the area of reducing methane. Uh, people talk a lot about carbon dioxide. Uh, another area that's important is methane. Uh, now methane has um, the point is that it actually is, 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 is the more of it than, than carbon dioxide. It's actually produced from uh, human lives. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that it, it accounts for about one third of the global warming. Uh, and actually uh, a lot of it uh, can, uh, is, is obtained from, you can see here from this part here, it say that the, the, the major producers of methane are agriculture, coal mining, solid waste management, and wastewater management. Oil and gas is, is, is you can see that one of the five, but it's not, it's not all of it. We're only, producing 20 to 25% of it. However, we can do things about it. We are doing things by uh, eliminating the methane that it are or reducing uh, to a minimum, the amount of methane that we are producing from, from our work. And, uh, and in order to do that, uh, we're, we're, you actually need to monitor and report uh, in order what is being produced. Uh, the sustainable consumption of, 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 of the things we, and that's the important part when we talk about the, the new research we'll be doing. Now we need to do an increase in our innovation to <clears throat> in, in machine monitoring and in order how do we want to prevent the losses and to uh, have the, these things done at a scale that actually are helpful. And we also need to upgrade our, our uh, production operations in order to be able to minimize that. I need to move a little bit faster so I can give you guys some chance to, to ask questions. Uh, one other thing is, is uh, use, using hydrogen as a storage thing. There are different color, different types of hydrogen. Probably the one that is very important for us is the blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is, is, is a produced from natural gas and we actually produce hydrogen and we actually do the underground story. As a matter of fact, uh, only last week, the chief executive officer of Saudi Aramco, which is the largest oil company in the world, uh, in, in, in his uh, <clears throat> uh, description of what his company is doing, he's saying that uh, they are, that's one of the areas, actually that is the area they are going to be spending a lot of time working on. Uh, and uh, here is, here is uh, uh, something from a recent publication. The petroleum industry has the technology, le technical leadership, and all aspects related to blue hydrogen generation, supply, and use. So we, it, this is the stuff that we're doing, and we, we still need to do some research in that. We're talking, we, you're, and, and, uh, because we don't have all the answers, but th we're the ones who are gonna be doing that. Another area is the area of geothermal or, or uh, uh, 
enhance the geothermal systems. Uh, in geothermal right now, what you do is that you go to an area which you have a very abnormally high temperature, you drill a well and you produce steam or very high hot water and from the heat, you actually produce electricity. In the enhanced system, we actually don't have to produce fluid. We're gonna find, we're gonna drill wells deep enough and we are going to fracture the things below there. We only can extract the heat, not specifically the fluid. One more time. We're the one who are going to be drilling the wells, we're going to be producing the heat, and we're going to be doing it. So there's a lot of work still needed to be done. <clears throat> there are challenges there. The reason I'm mentioning these things are two reasons. Number one, they are the, the, the things that we need to do in order to uh, uh, take care of the climate change things. We are part of the solution uh, as well as everybody else. And number two, they, there is still some work need to be done. We don't have all the answers, but we actually are on the right track. Uh, so uh, in order to do that, there will be one of the things we need to be aware of. We said, we need to find your goal and you find that you put what your skills in order to reach your goal. So uh, in order to do that, these are the skills that right now <coughs> are in the core <coughs> of what we engineers do. We need to also learn some new skills in, in, in these areas here, in the area of carbon capture and substation, in the energy efficiency, we'll talk about the methane, for example, hydrogen production, enhanced uh, 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 geothermal system. So we need to actually doing that. And it won't also wouldn't hurt us to actually have very good knowledge about other soft skills like communication and working with others and making presentation. So <clears throat> petroleum engineering has always been in transition as continue to do that because our job is to give the world the energy they need. So uh, to conclude, uh, the research in our, in our area advanced the technology for over the years. Uh, SPE is uh, doing a lot of work in order to support the students. And our industry is facing challenges uh, in, in the sustainable output. We need to increase it in the, solving the climate challenges and for the transition of the in energy from uh, to part of it to uh, non-renewable, uh, to renewable. Energy transition does not mean, it, it means two things. It means transition within the oil and within what we're doing now and transition to what we'll do in the future. Um, don't have a lot of time left, I know that, but uh, that's the end of my uh, slides. And if you guys have any questions, I will be happy to try to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamal, for this informative session. So given the time limit, we'll be answering uh, like two questions. Uh, the first question, and I think you have also mentioned it in the slides, uh, could you name these some specific skills that any fresh graduate should have or work for having it? I am sorry, I, I don't think I, I heard you. Well, you said, uh, I, can I name what? Uh, some uh, skills that any fresh graduate should have or work for having it. You mean some courses? Uh, skills. Skills. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, well, actually, when we talk about uh, there, <laughs> the, the, the new, new skills, we need to be <clears throat> aware of uh, what is actually going to be required in order to work with uh, the carbon capture and uh, sequestration. Uh, we need to uh, make our, our, ourselves uh, aware of what, what should we do in order to minimize the production of methane in the, in, in the world. Uh, by the way, we're just gonna minimize it. We're not gonna, we cannot eliminate it because it, it's part of human nature. Uh, <clears throat> we also need to, continue to work on uh, one of the things which I think is, is, is completely in our ballpark is the, is the enhanced geothermal systems. Uh, these things, by the way, exist everywhere. The, the, the advantage of the enhanced geothermal systems is that because they do not have to be existing in areas where you already have higher, abnormally higher temperature, can be anywhere, just like 
when we talked about when we talk about production from shale gas or shale oil when we talk about we not we don't need to go to look for the reservoir type quality we're looking for the source rock and we're making reservoir out of it exactly the same thing here so these are some of the additional uh skills that we that we need to have in addition of course to we need to be good at doing what we're doing right now everything that we know about good engineers drilling production reservoir engineering facilities and and, and, and all the thing one of one of the other important things to do is the uh, communication skills this is uh, being able to work on finding ways that when you are trying to present an idea how to present it effectively and have to do that concisely and you have to present it with the point of that i want to make sure that i get the audience to recognize what i'm trying to tell them and hopefully achieve the result i'm looking for so um I think we're out of time. So we apologize for not answering uh, all our questions given the time limit. Uh, thank you again, doctor, for this presentation. We are grateful for the time and effort you took for uh, sharing this presentation. And thank you to everyone who participated and attended in uh, this, uh, the first session in this conference. Now, please note, we'll be having a 10 minutes break and we'll be having another uh, session with Dr. Tarek Abdul-Fatouh.